There are lots of examples of uh, human-made things breaking the sound barrier. So, for example, um, in airplanes, it was a long time people were actually trying to break this sound barrier. In other words, go faster than the speed of sound. But, of course, there were lots of problems with it. And one of them is that at those speeds, you know, as you're going really fast, the control surfaces, so, you know, like the uh, ailerons on the wings, for example, on the elevators over here on the tail, those are actually very hard to control. And that's actually because things can become unstable and then uh, perhaps there's there's actually issues where, I mean, you actually lose control. So there were lots of uh, pilots when they were trying to, you know, go faster than the speed of sound, they would actually lose control and the plane might break up and a lot of people actually died in this sort of pursuit. I mean, there's rumors that, uh, that some people did it in the 40s. Um, you know, in the military during World War II in a dive, but it's it's not really conclusive. The first person who's sort of credited with going faster than the speed of sound in an airplane is an American by the name of Chuck Yeager, and he did this in 1947. Now, he flew this airplane here, this one that you can see in this picture, it's called the Bell X-1. And so what they did is, uh, one of the things they did to sort of figure out uh, or to help the problem of the control surfaces not working is they moved the tail, sort of the this horizontal stabilizer here, up higher. In fact, planes later on had it even higher up. It turned out that really helped. Also, it was rocket powered instead of just regular jets. So there's a lot of things that made this, you know, very good for going faster than the speed of sound. I mean, nowadays, um, planes that go faster than the speed of sound for faster than Mach 1 um, often have swept wings. So now, you know, a lot of times the wings are sort of, you know, swept back, for example. And um, they have more powerful engines. And they even follow this thing called the area rule, which essentially tells you where to put the wings. You know, if you assume that the fuselage is this, um, this right here is the fuselage, by the way, this piece here. If you assume that it's sort of a... a uh, some sort of cylinder, then this area rule sort of tells you where to put the wings. But I mean, planes now go even faster. And I mean, when I say now, I mean, we've got, uh, well, we humans have, have developed lots and lots of planes that go faster than the speed of sound. Uh, one really neat example is this SR-71. That was an American spy plane um, used uh, well, in the 70s and 80s and uh, a little bit later on as well and that's this picture here of this plane i mean the the people flying it they had to wear full pressure suits i mean they really are they're sort of like astronauts i mean this plane flew super high it went over three times the speed of sound so more than mach 3. i mean you can see this airplane is very aerodynamic in other words the idea is that air can really slip over it easily and actually what's really cool is that it would get so hot while it flies because of course there's lots of friction from the air passing over the surface that it actually would stretch out a little bit. So actually some of the material would actually sort of elongate a little bit. And in fact, in order to do to sort of accommodate that, this plane leaked so much oil and fuel that as soon as it takes off, basically, it needs to be refueled right away. In other words, as soon as this plane actually goes up in the air, it has to have a, an air-to-air -air refueling to actually fill it up because it's already lost so much. I mean, this thing just leaks like crazy. And the reason it leaks is because, well, when it goes faster, of course, all those leaks sort of fill up because everything uh, gets heated and so it gets stretched and so everything sort of fills in. It's kind of a neat design. Now, there are lots of other planes that go even faster. I mean, NASA built um, something called the X-15, and they went super fast. And there's even plans now to build something called the X-51. It's been nicknamed the Wave Rider. And the idea is that it would go really, really high up, and because uh, there's a problem with uh, jet engines. I mean, they can't really breathe very easily. They can't really sort of breathe air very easily, and jet engines need air. And so um, these rockets would be needed or other cool designs like what, what this thing uses called a scramjet. So there's some really cool designs now that are being used in order to try to go even faster. But now airplanes are not the only thing to go the speed of sound. In fact, this is a car, believe it or not, that went faster than Mach 1. And it did it a couple times along a desert uh, floor here, so it's nice and smooth. And this car actually went faster than Mach 1, sort of one way, and then turned around and came back and did it again, just to make sure. That's part of having the record. It was called Thrust SSC. And so this, uh, the guy driving the car is actually a military pilot. He's British, I think. And um, they actually went faster than the speed of sound. So they went just over Mach 1. 
And uh, now there's actually plans to build a new one. This one here, this is the, the car. Um, it's, it hasn't been totally tried out yet. But this is a new one called Bloodhound. I welcome you to look it up. It's actually really cool. And they have a cool website where they actually show some of the things going on behind this. This is a crazy car. They're actually hoping to go way more than Mach 1. I mean, they're hoping to go around 1,000 miles per hour. And remember that Mach 1 is around 760 miles per hour and these guys want to go that's their goal is to go greater than a thousand miles per hour so that's the plan for this bloodhound here now of course there's other things too i mean uh, it's not just airplanes and cars of course bullets do and that's why actually when a bullet flies i mean you hear this loud crack and that's actually because it's making this shock wave here and that's because this is for example on a, uh, a bullet that's going supersonic that's because it's going 780 meters per second. And remember, the speed of sound is roughly 340. So it's going, uh, well, more than twice the speed of sound here. So that's why when a bullet flies through the air, it makes a really loud crack. I mean, that's because there's actually a sonic boom. So just like we were looking at with airplanes flying over and it makes this big boom, bullets do the same thing. That's why bullets flying are just so loud. Well, of course, what people can do, they can make what's called a silencer. So you can take a bullet and actually slow it down as it leaves the gun. And basically that silences it. And why does it silence it? You basically slow it down until it goes less than the speed of sound. Because that way you don't have this sonic boom. You still have a shockwave, but it won't be this loud boom. Other examples of things that do it, I mean, this is a picture of Indiana Jones here, but the end of a whip. Actually, the reason why a whip, when you actually crack it right, it makes this loud crack, that's actually because the end of the whip actually goes faster than the speed of sound. And even more awesome, I think, that in uh, 2012, this is a crazy guy named Felix Baumgartner, he actually went uh, faster than the speed of sound in free fall, which means just by dropping. So what he did in order to go so fast in free fall, I don't know if you remember this, but um, I've done some other videos talking about free fall how you reach a terminal velocity. And this terminal velocity is like the maximum speed that you can reach when you're in free fall. And that of course depends on a lot of things like the density of the air, but also your surface area and your position. Which means, you know, if you're sort of laying sort of sideways like this right here, if this is you sort of falling down, at some point, I mean, of course, gravity is accelerating you downwards. But um, there's also friction. In other words, the air resistance that's sort of acting opposite to your direction. And at some point, you reach a certain velocity where the downwards force of gravity is going to be equal to the upwards force of drag, we could call it, or air resistance. These two forces are the same. Now, that doesn't mean you just hover in midair. What it just means is you no longer accelerate. So you keep going at the same constant speed. So that's called terminal velocity. Now, how can you go fastest? Well, one thing to do is to make your surface area smaller. I mean, remember, um, making your surface area bigger is what slows you down. That's why you wear a parachute, because that makes your terminal velocity much slower. But in this goal, if you want to go even faster, well, step one, turn yourself straight down. So that's, that's a good way to do it. In fact, uh, you know, um, lots of animals uh, figured this out, like falcons, for example. They fly straight down. They tuck in their wings. So maybe instead of having your arms out, maybe you put your arms by your sides. I don't mean to cut off this guy's arms, but basically put your arms by your sides, put your legs by your sides, and go down you know, as fast as you can. And that will mean that although you're still going to reach terminal velocity, it'll be faster than this terminal velocity. And even better, if you want, is go even higher where there's less air resistance. And that's what this guy did. So this Austrian named Felix Baumgartner, in 2012, he actually went up to the highest altitude that anyone's ever jumped out. Now, he didn't do it in a plane, he did it in a big balloon. So he went into a big, giant, uh, helium-filled balloon, so he has this little capsule here. And when they first sort of launched the balloon, it's sort of, it's not actually very big, it's sort of this big, giant, helium-filled balloon here. But as it goes higher, what happens is the helium-filled balloon actually fills up and actually becomes this big, round thing. They did this on purpose, so that way it wouldn't burst. Now, of course, there's a danger that as it goes higher, it actually bursts, and then, of course, this capsule goes down. The idea for him, though, was that to go up as high as he could and basically just jump out and then go down. Of course, he tried to get in this position, and away he went. Now, some of the really interesting facts, I think, are, first of all, the altitude that he went at. He jumped from 39,000 
meters, just over that, which is uh, 128,000 feet, just a little bit more than that. So that is, I think, pretty crazy, first of all. He's super high. The previous record had been 100,000 feet, which is still crazy. I mean, you have to wear pretty much an astronaut suit because there's so little pressure uh, there and there's so little air. That you, I mean, you need your suit to sort of bring a little atmosphere for you to breathe. Now, of course, then what did he do? Well, I mean, he actually, um, well, as he went down, he actually reached a speed of around, um, it's been thought that he went around uh, 1,342 kilometers per hour, which is, I think that was, yeah, 833 miles per hour. Remember what the speed of sound is, it's around 1,200 kilometers per hour. So he actually went more than Mach 1. And what's really cool is he was in free fall for 4 minutes and 20 seconds. Now you might so his goal was to actually go the fastest. So that's why he actually did it. So he actually broke the speed of sound technically while you know dropping in free fall. But you might think, oh well he must have also had the longest free fall record. But no he didn't. Now the reason he didn't is because the previous uh, record holder um who would jump from around a hundred thousand feet, he actually went even longer. So he opened his parachute basically later. But of course, uh, Baumgartner's goal was to go down like this. I mean, he could have actually been in free fall longer. Had he been in this position the whole time, he would have gone a lot slower because right? his terminal velocity would have been less, but he would have had the longest free fall. But his goal was to go the fastest. So he said, I'm going to or orient myself as straight down as I can. Now, of course, there was a danger when he's going like this. The danger is to start sort of rotating around, doing a spin. In fact, the previous guy, the guy who went from 100,000 feet, um, is an American named Joe Kittinger. Um, he had actually done it, and when he did that, one of his first jumps, he actually passed out completely just because he was rotating so fast. I mean, he was going many, many, many times per uh, minute. So, I mean, he was really rotating around super, super fast, enough to where he lost consciousness. But thankfully, he had an automatic parachute system that let it go, and away he went. Of course, he tried higher and higher flights or drops until he reached around 100,000 feet. But this Felix Baumgartner did it uh, from even higher. And luckily, he didn't pass out. But uh, while he was falling, he did start to spin. But thankfully, he was okay. So let's actually look at a quick little uh, video here, actually, that I'd like to show you. And uh, let's actually take a look at that here. So let's just look at this video here. And I think this will be really cool to see. So I've got the sound off, and I hope the little ad doesn't come up. But you can see as they launch him, this is just sort of the, the highlight, so it's only a minute 30 long. So you can see him in their balloon. It's not super full yet when they launch it. But away they go, then they go up. I think it's pretty cool, actually. So they, they did this um, not super long ago from when I'm recording this, but actually they did this in 2012. I thought it was pretty fun, actually. My wife and I sat down and we watched the live feed from it. Some people say, well, he didn't do much. He just jumped out. And that's sure fine, but it must have been pretty scary. And they actually really had to push a lot of the technology forward. In fact, the guy who had originally done the record, the 100,000 foot record guy, Joe Kittinger, he was actually in the um, control center there, so helping him out. So here he goes. He's jumping out as high as anyone's ever jumped out for free fall. I think it's pretty cool. And away he goes. There was no clouds that day. It's really beautiful, actually. So imagine just jumping and then being in free fall for four minutes. I mean, he's practically in space when he's doing this. So, of course, he started spinning a lot. But thankfully, uh, that got fixed. So away he went in his position, sort of head down a little bit. And of course, eventually, he had his parachute. And there's Joe Kittinger there, who's happy for him. And away he went. He landed, and everything was fine. So hooray for Red Bull, I guess they sponsored him, and I guess they didn't quite give him wings, huh? they gave him a parachute. But in this case, the way he went. It's a pretty interesting story. But in any case, people, not just airplanes can go faster than the speed of sound, but whips and bullets and cars, and there's this whole history about how planes started to do it. So all that to talk about going faster than the speed of sound.